Hugues Charbonneau is a founder and director of uh, Gallery Hugues Charbonneau in Montreal. Over the past five years, artists represented by the gallery have exhibited in museums and Biennales in Austria, Brazil, Belgium, Britain, Canada, China, Finland, France, Holland, Ireland, Italy. It might have been easier to list the countries they haven't exhibited in. Uh, Russia, Switzerland, and the USA. Before the gallery, Ug worked as a co-curator of the Spring of Quebec in Pittsburgh at S Magazine, Gallery Division, and the Arsenal, Montreal and Toronto. He also served on the board of directors of Skoll, Art Text, and AGAC, and sat on the jury of the 2015 RBC Painting Competition. Uh, in the coming months, Ug will be a judge of the 2017 and 2018 BMO First Art Competition. And now to judge the judge. Ugg's talk tonight is coordinated for SICA seminar participants with a reading on the art market by Sarah Thornton. The last line of the reading is a dark one. Spoiler alert for those of you who haven't gotten to it. Um, on the New York art market, its auction houses and prestigious galleries, Thornton has this to say, quote, in these spectacles, the dollar value of the work has virtually slaughtered its other meanings. Um, as a story about the art market, Ugg's talk tonight is on curriculum, but his highly conscientious way of working with art, artists, and their publics takes us miles away from the cynical world Thornton describes. Ugg's gallery for me is unrecognizable as a part of that world. More to the point, it's a model alternative to it. His excitement about the works he shows and his insight about their meanings is infectious. And what of the spectacle Thornton mentions? Ugg's programming often works precisely to undo the polished surfaces of the art market and its goods. The summer, uh, this summer, Ugg organized a number of uh, quote-unquote situations beyond the gallery. The second last was an open studio for one of the artists he represents. As I recall, it was important for Ugg uh, to give his audience a chance to see more of this artist's impressive 20 plus years of production than he could fit into the gallery. He was also interested in getting past the conventions of the exhibition, uh, the last perhaps overvalued stage in a curatorial and creative process, and sharing his experience of the living, breathing space of an artist's making. On the sidewalk in front of the studio, one of the artist's friends said that Uke had another motive for the event. The artist and his partner were facing the frightening prospect of having uh, to cover hospital costs for the birth of their baby without provincial or other coverage. Uh, Uke timed the open studio to help raise money for a young family in need. If there are stories like this in the art market, uh, Thornton tells us about in her, in her book, they aren't very common. Uke's care for the work he shows is equal to his care for the people uh, making it. We're honored to have you here tonight. Uh, please join me in welcoming Uke Charbonneau. Thank you. Okay, so, well, to, um, can you hear me well? Yeah, good, thank you. I'm getting older, so I'm going to put my glasses. Um, so the first thing that's interesting, I think, in, in the story is that I, w I studied fine arts at Concordia. So basically, I was sitting in this very room 20-some years ago and wondering how I could participate in the art scene. And uh, it was very intimidating to me. It felt like a a big click up there and, and something that I didn't know how to negotiate with. Uh, and I guess the, the answer came just through actions and through getting involved in it. But uh, so basically I prepared a, a lecture tonight um, to share a few things I've learned in the art community and also in the art market. And But the idea was to find things that, uh, experience on the terrain that could uh, help you think about what you could do with your art practice or just give you hints or possibilities. And also, uh, I want to reflect on the notion of agency, this idea that you have power over your art career and that th this career should be at the image of your values and of your art. Um, at any point, 
uh, if you have questions, raise your hand and there's a mic that could circulate. Or if you, you no, know, there's a lot of material we could cover. I'm gonna cover some aspect of it that I thought could be interesting to you. But I'm always happy to go in other places and uh, answer other quite kinds of questions. Would they be very practical or very theoretical? So, um, <coughs> so while I was in uh, studying in sculpture at Concordia, I wanted to do projects with my friends. And of course, uh, being still in my second year of undergrad, nobody would give me an exhibition necessarily in a museum. Or, and also, you have to think back to that back in the 90s, um, Facebook did not exist. Instagram didn't exist. Actually, I was using a typewriter to write essays. And so the, the ways by which you could gain a voice publicly were way different. And so you had less galleries. There was a huge recession in the 90s. So there were only a few galleries that had survived that. There were a few museums less than now and, and less artist-run centers either. So basically, there were as many artists as there are today, but less venues for them. And also, the projects we wanted to do were not necessarily the projects that people wanted to show or you know, we were not in dialogue. There was no dialogue going on. So so a few students and I had this idea. Basically, I was taking journalist, uh, journalism classes also while I was a student. And I really love this anecdote of the Corentos. Corentos are the ancestors of newspapers. So basically, from the 14th century to 18th century, people would print those little sheets of paper and, and they would distribute them. And sometimes they were philosophical statements, sometimes just ideas, sometimes just news. And one of the Corantos uh, grabbed my attention. It was uh, in England, in a personally repressive period. And uh, the king had this tendency to decapitate people would question his ideas. And uh, those, there was a Corento that was distributed in, in that period that would always reveal what the, the king was up to in a very critical way. But what was mesmerizing to the king is that it was ha revealed as he was about to apply it. And they never cut who wrote that uh, Corento. He decapitated a few people, but the Corento kept popping up, you know? <laughs> and basically, the, the historians have gone back, and, and the thesis is that basically it was one of the secretary of the king who would publish that Corento. And between towns, in his wagon, he, he had a, a micro press, a little press, and he would print the Corento on the road, arrive in town, and just drop it off. He would drop it off, and then it would, be, it would circulate. And I love this idea that uh, by being small and light, you could have, you could have a, a, some type of freedom, and you could have agency, and you, could, you didn't need huge means, and you could challenge a king just by being small and discreet and fast. Um, so I love newspapers. I love those type of publications. And, and at the time, there was virtually no website or internet. So the idea was to press something, to, to do a publication. If we could look at slide one, Vitali. So the idea was came to me to do this thing called La Petite Enveloppe Urbaine, the small urban envelope. And, and I guess the name of it, I, I thought, was uh, kind of brought forward the values we want to, uh, to, to use. So the idea was that also I was interested in the art world, but I was also very much interested in the city and citizenship. And um, so I wanted to get out there in the city I think the reflex was actually I was more interested in the city than the art world. And, and the idea was to go out there, think in an active way, not in a passive way about it, and participate in that city. I was arriving from St. Canute, you know, a little town. And, and I was mesmerized by the city, Montreal, the potential of Montreal. So the first one, actually, uh, I, I worked with a, a young uh, artist fellow, Jonathan Plante, who I still work with, who's one of the artists I work with at the gallery, and a young art history student named Cynthia Hammond, who happened to teach at Concordia today. And then there was also uh, Stéphane Saint Laurent, my friend. And basically, the idea was that we, no, we, we had no money. So basically, we, would, we went and we bought at uh, Staples some envelopes, five and a half by eight and a half. And so you could fit like a, a page folded into in it. And we would fill it with artworks, ideas, like. Uh, sometimes VHS tapes, you know, because that's what we're using at the time, but also like uh, photographies, uh, pins, all kind of things. And there would be a thematic. The first one was the cities and cemeteries. And uh, so each of the artists took some, and then we sold a few, we did a little fundraising thing, and then we abandoned them in cemeteries. So people would go in the cemetery with 
read essays, find photographs, uh, little things about the cemeteries. And then, um, but what was exciting, actually I don't remember <laughs> most of the projects we did, but uh, what I remember we decided that we would get together for weeks and we would talk about ideas and read text. And, and because we're aiming at something, we we're, were going to do a project, it all got really real, you know. And a network would build from that. So the second urban envelope, someone came to me and said, no, it was really fun, we should do a second one. And, um, but one of the students was from uh, Latvia. So then suddenly there was an envelope in Montreal and there was an envelope in Latvia. And there was an exchange between the students. And then there was a third envelope uh, and a few others. Uh, one that I particularly liked was uh, the supplement to the travel guides. So we went in bookstores and we inserted it in travel guides you know, about Montreal. And Remember, there was no internet, so that was the, the way you would talk about Montreal. And, the, um, and then uh, really magical st things started happening. Uh, uh, at the time, for example, Skull, the Art Restaurant Center, was doing a programmation, maybe we could look at slide two, called Le Commenceau. And uh, there was basically a group of artists in Montreal that, just like us, were participating in the city, like we're doing projects. Some of them, like Mathieu Ge uh, Mesmo Guerrera, uh, Mathieu Beausséjour, all names that might sound familiar to some of you today, but at the time, they were all young fellow artists. And, um, and we didn't know it, actually. We didn't know the term, but I guess we were doing relational practice. And art theoricians started being interested in that f form of art and Bourdieu's text and about relational practice. And that basically, the relationship to the public was the artwork. It was not the object. And so I found myself in this circle of artists that were extremely exciting and young art theoretician and, and we created a community around those ideas. And, um, and we would often have other cities in other countries, other students or other young artists who would pair with us for those projects. Because at Concordia, people come from everywhere. So they would go back during Christmas holidays, come back and, and, uh, and share the idea with other people. And then the, the network would get bigger. And I guess one of the, the, the hypotheses of the Fitzsimple of Urban, where it got to be a big urban envelope, was uh, the, someone called me. She had participated in one of the projects, and, and she was by then living in Pittsburgh. And she said, Ugh, there's the spring of Quebec happening in Pittsburgh. There's a big project of the Quebec government in Pittsburgh where they were going to showcase Quebec culture. So there was a Marie Chouinard in dance, uh, Denis Arcan movies, and uh, Anyway, and there was a, a, a small uh, visual art component to that. And, uh, and basically, uh, she said, no, we should just parasite it. We'll do our own little project on the side. And, and uh, at the time, it was post-September 11. George W. Bush was in power. And I thought the thematic could be uh, science fiction as social commentary. So we gathered artists in Montreal. Uh, and we gathered artists in Pittsburgh, and we started working on our little network and what we were going to do, and meeting, and phone calls, and all that. And then one of the young artists in Pittsburgh was working at the Carnegie Mellon you know, as a TA, and uh, eventually the Carnegie Mellon joined. And one of the young artists was working at the Warhol Museum, and then the Warhol Museum joined as a partner in the project. And then there was this big factory abandoned in the middle of Pittsburgh, and uh, one of the young artists was uh, involved as a technician on what was going to open soon, and they didn't have a, a first show, so they just said, yeah, you know what, we have this 10,000 square feet space, would you like to do something with it? And so then we start curating that. And by that point, the Quebec government hear about that project going on, and they're wondering what's, what's happening. So we talk about it, and I tell them that we have those partners, you know, the Warhol Museum, the Carnegie, this and that, and we're going to do this project. And, and they said, you know what, actually, we haven't, <laughs> we haven't we succeeded at getting a space. Could we join your project? And, um, and so that's how basically the, the, our network evolved. And then, and, uh, I have, by, for the record, I've never applied for a grant in my whole life. And, and, and that's the only time I got one, because uh, they, they said, would you like to, to get a grant for this project? And I said, well, I, I don't really feel like writing the grant and all that. I said, well, <laughs> you're getting the grant. <laughs> so, so anyway, so we got the grant, and we did this project. And because we have such a network of artists, oh, they are rooted in the community with a fantastic, great opening, and, and, um, and then they um, ended up being on talk shows, blah, blah, blah. The, 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 exciting, the, the strange thing is that usually I would always put an artwork in there, and it's the first time I didn't have time to make an artwork. And um, 
it was a turning point in my life where I realized that not being an artist was actually allowing me to uh, defend the other artists a bit better and, and within myself I felt a bit better and I could go a bit further and I was in a position uh, where I can promote people better. So that's a turning point in my own personal life where it's the first time I stopped making art. And I guess I was not much of an artist because I haven't missed it. So, <laughs> so, so basically, the, from that point on, um, uh, I started being involved with the artist-run centers like Skull or Boho, and uh, I really uh, uh, like collaborating with them. We would launch the envelope in there, and uh, and eventually we start working with the Canadian Center for Architecture and with different institutions. The, the Petit Centre Urbain, to this day, I, I think, is still going on. I've stopped doing it in 2004, but there's people that keep doing them. Uh, so you might come across Petit Centre Urbain one day. And uh, through that network, uh, I started doing another project called Carte Blanche, which was a poster. Again, printing things. And basically, carte blanche means, uh, carte blanche, I think it exists in English, huh? do what you want, kind of a deal. And basically, the idea was that uh, uh, the poster on the front would be a pro an artist project, and the artist would really do what they want. And on the back, I would sell advertisement, and I would have partnerships that would fund the project. And also, the network, the idea was that, again, by working together, we could go a bit further. So the idea was that the partners, if they were to distribute it, would get visibility on it and would gain if the project was working. And um, I was interested in cities again, so I wanted to do this in Montreal. And then I thought, why not Toronto also? And I just read Catcher in the Rice. I said, why not New York also? You know? So I went to New York. and with my little posters under my arm as an, and start going to galleries and uh, artists run non-profits, they call it New York. And to my surprise, it was very difficult to get people moving in Montreal. They would have to talk to the board and they would have to talk to this and this, this. And it was a slow process. But in New York, people were just like, yeah, yeah, let's do it, let's do it. So uh, Printed Matter, which is a great uh, space in New York, started distributing the project, partnering with us, and then there were uh, a few galleries in Brooklyn and in Chelsea, and this thing kind of gained the momentum. And in New York, people are just, you know, there's just so much happening, and at the same time, people like have to seize opportunity. So, uh, so I guess at some point, things happen of that sort. So the second time we went to launch number two, it was actually the Guggenheim Museum introducing our project in New York. And we were working with, a, I think we had a $500 budget for this. And, but it, it was distributed at, by that time at 5,000 copies in the, in the three cities and people started talking. And grew out of that a project called Montreal Brooklyn. I don't know if you, some of you were aware there was an exchange between Montreal and Brooklyn a few years ago. So the project was born out of that dialogue between the different galleries and artist run center that gathered around that pretext. You know, the, the, the poster was more pretext to work together and to get to know each other than it was really uh, such an exciting thing on its own. Um, so um, that's it. So basically the conclusion of that period was that I, what I've learned through that is that I had absolutely no voice and I had no resources to do things, but if we were getting together, uh, we could really make, make things happen. And then people, if that. If we create a structure that was not a hierarchy, but that actually people could gain from the structure together, magical things were happening. Um, and the other thing, actually, that was the most interesting out of that, for maybe, is that that network of young artists is still to this day my network. So basically, those students I was working with are now curators in museums, and our artists I work with are now art critics I work with. So basically, we recognize each other in our values and in our interests at the point where we had nothing to gain from each other. We just got to know each other through actions together. And we really formed sincere friendships. There was no opportunity there. It was really that decided we were on a project together and we're having a, a, good, a good time together and discovering things together. Um, then there was a huge detour in my life. Things happen like that. You know, you're broke, you're a student, you have to pay off your loans, you have to pay off your visa, you're a young curator. So, so I had an offer to work uh, uh, for a private art gallery, a very private commercial art gallery called Bellefeuille, which is, uh, will sell works by Jim Dine and uh, the Big Hearts. And uh, we would resell works uh, by Damien Hirst or Chuck Close, things like that. And basically, uh, and, and not necessarily in the most exciting work by those artists, but maybe more the blue chip kind of safe, uh, recognizable work by those artists. And um, it was supposed to last just a few months for me to pay off my, my loan and all that, but I guess I got a bit cut up in it, like I, 
kind of exciting at the same time, no? And I, and I, I come from, play, you know, I don't come from money, and, and there was this kind of excitement of suddenly, like, seeing those big figures flying around and, you know, and being in New York and the big art fairs and discovering that world or, you know. And uh, so I, I went a bit further than I thought in that line, uh, but I've learned a trade and I've learned what the art market is, which is a very private place, and the logistic of that art market. What happens at the back store in Gagosian? What happens? How does those deals happen? How are things happening and pre-sales and all those things and auction, how they are tied with the market. So I had to experience it in a strange way. I, I was there and I was experiencing those things. No? And uh, after that uh, period, I was uh, approached by a, a businessman to, um, who basically wanted to transform a factory into an art center. And if we could go to slide three, there you go. It's called the Arsenal. Maybe you visited it in Montreal. And there's one in Toronto also. So basically, Pierre wanted to, he had a few commercial galleries, and he wanted to bring that together under the banner Galerie Division. And he, Galerie Division already existed. There was Ben Klein, great artist, who was running it for him. And, but he wanted to merge all things together and basically transform uh, old, dirty uh, factory into an art center. And I got catapulted, I accepted, I accepted. It was kind of fun and, you know. And, and, and then it, the idea was uh, that we would create the in, things, and, and his idea as a businessman was to bring the art community, the business community, and through events, you know, like the Formula One VIP party, da 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 da, and that they would see contemporary art, discover contemporary art, and it would change the world. And um, the, the, the reality of it, maybe it will happen, but uh, the reality of it was that it was a lot of logistics and a lot of meeting with lawyers and a lot of meeting with accountants and a lot of numbers and a lot of this and that. And the more it was going, the less I was dealing with artists. I would have staff that would deal with staff that would deal with artists. And it was like, I, I didn't feel connected. I, I think during that period, I didn't visit a single studio. Uh, so eventually, uh, and for all kinds of other reasons, uh, I decided to uh, to leave this. I'll just look at my note in case there's something I forgot. Oh yeah, there was something I want to tell you. Is that uh, by then emails in, uh, were invented, and um, and basically the the how important in the art market of the early 2000s emails were, and how basically we were for the first time maybe dealing with a global art scene. You know, I have a short anecdote of uh, Mr. Moose, who had a gallery back in the 70s in Canada. And Mr. Moose w told the story of how to sell an artwork in a different city back in the 70s. Basically, you had to have a slide made of the artwork, you know, like a four by five slide. And then you would get the slide a week later. And then you would mail it to the collector in the other city. The collector would get it in the mail a week later, open it. And then you would try to connect with him by phone. And if he said, yeah, I would like to see the artwork, then you, you would have to go with the artwork to Calgary or wherever you were going, wait in the hotel room or motel room by the phone, because there were no cell phones. And, and then you would go visit the collector, show him the artwork, and you really hoped he liked it, you know? Um, but by the time I was an art dealer, basically, we had emails. And, and what changed is that suddenly, uh, also, the web existed then, and suddenly people could research things also. So your your collector in Montreal uh, could buy from dealer in New York by email. He was in correspondence with those people, was informed of what was going on around the world. But I could sell to people in Korea. I could sell to people in New York. I could. So basically, if you had blue chip art, you put your chuck clothes on the website or on Artnet or something like that. Then a collector in Italy can contact you and say, I really want it. No, a big image of a guy with a beard, like no, and and then you would kind of set that up and send emails and correspond, and you would send a wire transfer. You ship the artwork, and the the ray, and also the fairs starting taking more and more place in the art world, and the exhibitions were less and less important. In other words, collectors didn't want to see the shows and gallery and travel and all that. They would be fed information through emails, and the momentum would be built, and in the end, they would go to Basel or to Miami a big party on the beach, go to the fair, and it's this excitement, it's, it's glamorous, and they would buy artworks that way. And that's a shift. It was not always like that, but it had become that by that point. So in that type of world, basically, the bigger is the better. You know, it's like uh, you have to be loud. You have like, you no, know, and those 
boots will cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and you have to ship artworks and the artworks are worth hundreds of thousands you cannot go there with emerging artists you have to like arrive there with very expensive art and so basically it's, it's a financial game at some point um, there's a an article that came out in the New York Times uh, recently, there's many articles that have come up about the kind of a shift that we see happening right now as we speak, which is that basically when I opened my gallery in 2012, you could hope, or I thought, you could start with small and then you would make your way and build a capital and then you would like get bigger, go to the fairs in New York and Miami, and then you would get more collectors and build your practice and, and then eventually you could have a bigger boot and you could da 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 da. The statistic is now that basically galleries um, under 50 million dollar of business in a year are going down all of them this is the, the breaking point where people will start growing right now is above 50 million dollar so i don't have 50 million dollar anyway but so so the idea is that basically you need that kind of yearly budget to function to have the big boot because the collectors now they go at the big boot in the center of the fair they don't go around you know and so basically, they want safe values, they want to be in the center, you have to reassure them that you have the power to make things happen. And so that game, basically, you're on the margin. And, and so a gallery, so galleries like, for example, Andrea Rosen would represent David Atmej, and who only had probably a $20 million budget per year, could not follow. She, she, she closed her practice. And so basically, in the, in the last years, a lot of galleries have closed in New York, in Berlin, in France, just in Montreal, four this year, in Toronto, just during the art fair, two gallery closed. So basically what you have happening is a disappearance of the mid-range gallery. There's the mega gallery, the multinational that has eight galleries around the world or four galleries around the world that can afford those prices, that works with a very big collector, collectors and institutions. The mid-range galleries are disappearing and then you have the emergence of a new generation of young galleries that work with project spaces. And so basically you have great project spaces a bit everywhere. People will be like bartenders at night and they open the gallery, they are two or three and they share the gallery and they make it happen that way. Sometimes artists, sometimes art historians, but basically, so you, those people do the groundwork, they discover the artists, they, they, they work on a community level and then there's the, suddenly you, you're supposed to jump as an artist from like that to Gagosian. <laughs> so that gap, it's like, it's, it's hard to imagine that trajectory, like what, what brings you there, no? Uh, but uh, of course, there's just one way of looking at it, and we're, we're going to explore other ways of looking at this. Um, what I've learned also in that period is basically to recognize some motivations that were the fuel of the art scene, the art market, the, that, inter that type of international art market. So what motivates people to buy artworks, and all those private collectors, investment value. Uh, and actually, that has been identified as one of the main factors. They, they really want to buy art that they can resell with a profit within a few years. You know? And the, 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 uh, the art auction system is there to support that, that growth. There's brand value. You know, a, a lot of collectors, when I was working in, with those bigger galleries, you know, would show up and they would have like, you know, the, the Ferrari with the big logo, and then they would have the Coco Chanel glasses with the big logo, <laughs> the Louis Vuitton bag with 200 logos on it. You know? And then they would, they, they would look at the Chuck Close and they said, I don't want the, the, the kind of weird Brad Pitt Chuck Close. No, I want the big bearded guy. You know, the one like he did from 1970 to, to 2010, you know? I want that one. And so basically what they want is the, the brand. They want a recognizable, recognizable product that is safe, that has been uh, valued. It, it, there's a stored value within that visual style, within that signature, and they want to capitalize on that value. So brand value. And then there's a, something else, uh, which could start getting entertaining, but which is social status and lifestyle. You know, to be in Basel, or, or to be in Miami, you know, at the private party on the beach, those kind of things. And uh, to signify to your friends that you're in that lifestyle, that you can afford that, and that you can participate in that. So that's another thing. But then there's also, you know, there's also within that, and within all of those collectors, there's a minute little part, which is that. And also in other collectors is the main reason. And that's the thing that interests me, is people want to learn about themselves and want to learn about our times through a vibrant community of artists and curators. And those people exist, and there's enough of them to feed galleries like me or to, to feed 
to, to work with and I think to have a very interesting life <laughs> in the art world. Um, so, um, whoop, sorry, I'm just, I think my notes fell on the floor and they got all, all mixed up. Okay, so basically, um, after a while I got a bit fed up with all this to tell you the truth. And I was missing my beautiful days doing Pet Stamp the Building with friends and being in that community that I cared for. And by that point, also I had uh, accumulated, I guess, uh, enough momentum and network and um, expertise to feel maybe it was reasonable to start my own project. So I sold my house and I opened an art gallery. So that was 2012. Uh, maybe you can jump. That was the arsenal, by the way. But we can jump the next one. There you go. So that's the, the, the way. Uh, and Isabel, who's sitting in the back, who writes better than me, wrote our mandate. So, um, get Luc Charbonneau foster the individual practice of its artists and expand theoretical discourse through the, context, the contextualization of projects within and outside the gallery's walls. So basically, the, what we mean by that is that we like to explain art practices, put a context for it. The idea is not to say what people will want to hear to, to buy it or to, to bring forward the brand value of the artwork, but rather to really create a context where people will engage with the artwork and understand what the artist is trying to do. That demands more work, and it depends, demands different types of tools. Uh, so um, when I opened my gallery, basically I went from 80,000 square feet <laughs> to 1,000 square feet. And that was very conscious. It, it was a conscious choice. It was to really be extremely small and extremely light because my idea was that I would adapt to the artist. So each time we would have a, a new project, we would adapt. And sometimes maybe the artists don't need to be in the gallery. Sometimes we have to go outside of the gallery with the artist. And, but if you, you cannot do that when you pay huge rent and you, when, you, you know, when you're in that type of model of trying to. And also, you know what? I didn't feel like working with collectors who would be impressed by the big size of my space. And I thought there was enough smart people out there that we could, that would connect on the art, that we could sustain a model like that. Um, so the, um, the small gallery, a flexible structure, um, offering theoretical context, we've gone through that, and I wanted freedom, I really needed it. And the, um, uh, also there was this feeling, and I don't know if you felt that, that basically, you know, we're in an exciting city, and we could say the same thing about many other cities in Canada and the United States or many places, but the art world was somehow more beige than our cities. It was a bit more boring. It was a bit less exciting. It was a bit less dynamic than what you see when you walk on the streets and what you feel when you experience the city. And I wanted to have a city that would be at least you know, as exciting as our city. And so uh, for me, it was important, for example, that there would be as many women artists as men artists. Because you know the art market, you know, like the moment 98% of the artwork on display are by men. You know. And the art market at the art fair last year, probably the average was 90% of the displayed artists were men. You know, Yet, at Concordia, I think the ratio is 90% female students. Am I right? You know, so, so there's that strange thing that happened. But anyway, I wanted the, the, the gallery to also show this idea that um, uh, our culture is ex exciting because also it is the encounter of different cultures. And there's not one main culture in Montreal. There's different culture mixing. And I want to reflect that dynamic quality in the choice of artists I was going to work with. Um, and I didn't go for the obvious choices market-wise. I went for artists that I, I cared for and, and art practice that excited me. Um, yeah, desire to reconnect with the art community, to, to have more time to talk with curators, to visit artist run centers, to have time to read, to have time. So, so that means that the, that freedom, there's a price for that. And, and, but being small and light was the, the way to get there. Um, also, they added, added this, it's my little obsession, but I, I like this idea of inserting artists in art history, of like basically that, you know, that you can at least try to you know, position artists in museum and in art magazine that have the potential to inscribe them in something bigger than just the market, you know, something that would last outlast a bit, or you know that basically I had to treat my artists exactly like that if I was hoping that it would happen. Um, so also uh, interesting, it was to to re choose. Basically, I knew hundreds and if not a few thousand collectors by that point, but I narrowed it to 
a very small group of people that I thought would understand what the artists were doing also would not only see themselves as buyers of objects, but as participants in an art scene. So for example, collectors that would not necessarily think so much about owning the object and keeping it for themselves, but how about how they can you know, help the artist in, his, in its career and how they could be a, an ambassador for that artist and participate in conversation with the artist and be involved. And the, um, so those are all th kind of things. I'll come back to that a bit later, but what I encountered is the first obstacle, basically. My big obstacle was not the art market and it was not uh, I don't know, conformism or things like that. It was the great white noise. You know great white noise? It's like, you know, I'll give you an example. <laughs> One of my biggest clients is the National Gallery of Canada. They, they purchase a lot from uh, work from my artists, they, they follow us and they, they, they care for artists. But I noticed that looking at my emails that basically they never opened our emails, you know. And uh, so it would uh, happen in other ways, but they would not look at the emails we would send, would invite for exhibition, explain what we're doing and all that. So I came across the, the chief curator, and you have to understand that this woman uh, is also handling the Venice Biennale for Canada and the Sobe Award. So she's kind of popular, you know, in Canada. And, and, and she said, no, don't even bother sending emails to tell you the truth, because you no, know, in my inbox right now, today, I have 25,000 emails that I did not open, you know? And she's trying to open her emails, just as that, <laughs> that flow coming. Add to that that she's on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, that she has to attend uh, events, try to follow shows. So basically, imagine what her life is like, you know, that quantity of information just being slashed at her all day long. You no know, images just flying at her, emails, long emails, you no? Know? Because in 2000, people would read emails like that. They don't anymore. <laughs> and it was like, whoop. Anyway, so, so basically, we, we agreed on ways we would connect. You know? um, but she said, don't call me every week. But like, if you have a really good reason, give me a call and tell me like, I'm launching that email you know, in the ocean. You know? And she would go and fish it. But they, basically, so, so basically, that's, I think, and that's going to be also something you're going to have to face and deal with, is that basically the, the idea when I was in your spot in your chair was, how can I have a voice? Now the idea is more, how can my voice be heard? Because you can have a voice. You can open a Facebook account, an Instagram account. You can, you know, there's more artists run center than ever. There's all those, it's more like that night, you've worked three years towards a show, and the opening night, there's 10 other shows opening. And there's all kind of thing going on Facebook, Instagram, and how pe will people pay attention to what you're doing? That has come to be a big question in my life. Um, so part of my answer to that, and I'm going back to my Petit Envelope Urban Learnings, is that basically uh, people are shouting and shouting and shouting louder, and then you can pay for more visibility on Facebook to shout louder, and you can do this, and you can do that. You can put ads in art form. You can la have the big boot in the art fairs, and everybody's just trying to be louder, louder. And my strategy was to start whispering, and basically to, instead of yell and try to get the attention, just walk to someone <laughs> and talk gently and create a context where there could be an exchange of ideas and to not bother with the rest. And so I'll go a bit in those, what I mean by whispering. It's, a, it's an allegory, but, but, but like, what do I mean by that? That type of quality of conversation and how it can be difficult. But since everybody is out there yelling, Actually, it's interesting to see that curators, actually, nobody calls them anymore. And that, no, they have time for coffee. <laughs> and there's all those resources in, in, in another world that you, you can tap into. And, but also, you create relationship with people. Um, so uh, interestingly enough, for example, at the gallery, we don't have salespeople. We have art historians and who write dossiers and who can write wonderful press release like Anne Isabel does, and, and who can like basically go to studios, try to understand what they are doing and all that. So a typical client who walks in doesn't have to deal, deal with a salesman, will try to pressure sell, but will have access to resources to people who can explain them the work. And the, uh, and the other strategy that I've done is basically for the price of one boot in one art fair, I can fly all year long to see my artists at openings. So basically, if one of my artists, if a museum commits to exhibiting one of my artists, I'll be there at the opening. And we'll spend time together, and we'll talk about the art. 
and we'll have to spend time also giving them text and helping and facilitating the relationship with the artist if we can. And so basically that's why I, where I decided to invest and not in playing the game. And what's interesting also is, for example, we did a project uh, in Santa Fe with one of my artists and it was uh, commissioned by the Smithsonian. They were very generous. They funded the project and the curator of the Smithsonian was overseeing this. And basically that curator that I've worked with now twice has never seen my gallery. She doesn't know I have a small gallery. And uh, she will never see it. You know? And she doesn't see me as the backbencher in the corner at Freeze that nobody sees near the toilet. Basically, I fly in at the opening. She likes my artist, and that's the basis for the reason we're meeting. And because we're nerd, we'll spend two or three days you know, having dinner, seeing each other in different contexts, and we talk art. We talk about art. Like, I don't sing karaoke with her. I don't like, we talk about art. And then, a year later, when I call her, she picks the phone. And that's the idea. And that's why I re realized that basically that mapping of the art world did not interest me. The idea was just to be outside of that map and find other ways of relating to people and arrive fresh uh, with it on my own agenda. Like, um, other statistic about the art world, not only the, the, is the gallery $50 million and more, but basically 50% of art galleries in the world don't make money. So basically, they belong to rich people who don't have to make money with their. It's, it's another, they do it for other reasons. Uh, and the other, another interesting statistic for you that uh, a gallery would it be in Montreal, Toronto, New York, Berlin, Hong Kong? Uh, the average gallery will sell 95% of the artwork to private collectors, and 5% of the artwork will go to institution. And with uh, my wonderful team and the artists that I work with, who I think do amazing work, we've managed to basically sell 20% to private collectors and 80% 80, 80 of the artwork go to institutions because that's what we put our, invest our time into and that's what we care for. And it's more complicated to sell an artwork to a museum, but it, 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 it does something different. The artwork is public, it's seen, and it's contextualized. Um, so my client is not a type A rich dude that drives around, arrive, and buy compulsively an artwork and brings it home. Basically, it's a woman with a master or a PhD in art history. And she runs a collection. Would it be the collection of a museum? Or maybe she works for a foundation? Or maybe she advises people? And sometimes she works for a corporate collection. But basically, her idea is not to gain social status, and she's gonna, not going to resell it. She wants to pick the right piece. And the dialogue sometimes would be years. And sometimes it doesn't lead to an acquisition, but rather to an exhibition, you know, which is also interesting. But the, the idea is that basically we talk, and uh, we start exploring the work of an artist, and they see one show, then they see a second show, they see a piece in a fair. I'll send them a review if the artist is in, as a review, and, and we'll just build that knowledge around the artist. And comes a point where the context is right. And she'll say, you know what? We have this specific context at the museum we can acquire an artwork, or we have this BNL coming, we'll have budget to acquire work. And basically, now let's look at the artwork. And it has nothing to do with what's in the show, how fast things are selling the show and all that. They actually look less and less as an the exhibition. They'll want to look at what the artist has done, like before, and where they are now, where they're heading, understand what the artist is up to, and they will read the text about it, and they will go through all that. And actually, uh, uh, Vitaly, is there a way we could look at that dossier? I'll give you an example, OK? Uh, the, the OK, cool. So I'll bring you in the behind the scene of a, an art acquisition by a museum. So basically, um, uh, we could do the video with it. Oh, no, the image first, I guess, yeah. So transactions like that have nothing to do with uh, necessarily a, well, no, uh, no, not the PDF, uh, if possible, the, um, the JPEG. Or it can be the video if, if, you, if it's simpler for you, Vitaly. So basically, that trajectory, it takes those, those kind of complicated artworks, it takes a whole community for something to happen. It's not about a salesman talking to a buyer. So basically, uh, the artist I'm going to tell you about is uh, Maria Hopfield. And uh, Maria is a wonderful artist, um, activist, performing artist. Uh, 
She was also a feminist and also uh, an Ishnabi artist. And the, um, she was in, included in the exhibition Beat Nation that some of you might have seen. And the exhibition traveled through Canada through different institutions. And when it traveled, it was the, being, the beginning of Maria's public career. Like it, it, it was a new step for her. And the, uh, it was through curators that this happened. It had nothing to do with me. Basically, curators liked that her artworks included her in that project, and it traveled. And this piece, it's a photo of the installation. I want you to see the installation because there's X on the floor, and people are to jump with her. And now, Vitaly, if it's possible, we could watch a video. So basically, this artwork travels for two years, and then it's kind of a off of its trajectory, and, but then curators have been aware of it, and I've seen it, and it's now part of the history of some institutions. And uh, about a year ago, I wanted to do something for Montreal's 375th, but I was not interested necessarily in, in celebrating it the same way as I wanted to look at artists that would question the cities in a different way, and the idea of uh, agency and citizenship. And uh, I included different artists, and one of them was Maria, and we re-showed, we reactivated this wonderful video the title of it is Survival and Other Acts of Defiance. It's a very simple loop where Maria basically jump, and you're in front of her and you jump with her. You're invited to jump with her. And the, um, we could spend a lot of time just on this simple artwork. You know? First of all, the, the, it looks so simple. It looks like do-it-yourself camera. And it's probably that, but it's filmed in the back alley in Brooklyn, behind her studio. But there's an invisible loop in it. So basically, she looks like she's going to just jump forever, and she's so strong, and she's, she's, she's just kind of superhuman that can just jump and assert her presence continuously like that. But there's a hidden loop where basically she jumps for a few minutes, <laughs> but it, it goes forever. You can just jump with her, and you'll be tired, but she won't be tired, you know? And, um, and that's a very simple message, but at the same time, think of that powerful message of a positive, strong native presence. It's here, it's alive, it's strong. And it's as simple as that. She's wearing Anishinaabe boots uh, with a jingle, the kind of jingles they would use for some rituals or some weddings. It's tobacco uh, leaves that are rolled. Anyway, I love the simplicity of that statement, of that performance. And the title gives it this beautiful boom, tone. Uh, the, um, maybe, well, we could let it run without the sound or, I don't know. The, um, so basically that piece is on display at the gallery and uh, the curator of the Museum of Contemporary Art who has exhibited the piece a few years before, well she was not in place but the museum has exhibited the piece, sees it and by then many things have happened for Maria. You know, she had a beautiful show at the power plant, she was at the Venice Biennale, she, she did many projects and now they, they really want her work and seeing that piece just resets that. And, uh, and of course, like, we're in dialogue, so I let her know it will be exhibited. She comes, she sees it. Other members of the museum can see it. And so they want to acquire it. So how does that go? Like, how does a museum decide? How does one defend an artwork like that in the museum collection? And so basically, what they, it's not investment value. It's not the social status value. It's not the brand power of that piece that they are interested in. It's the content. And how has that content been inscribed in the trajectory of the artist and their démarche, in their work? How does that piece fit? Like, is that the right piece for the museum, for their collection? Is that So they want to understand that. And then basically w what we had to build, I wanted to show that on my laptop, but we had a little technical problem. I want you to see the, the whole dossier, what we put in there. Artist statements, CV, bios, all the text. You know, the, the text in all the different magazines, hyperallergic, all the different things. And um, also the essays and catalogs, the exhibition catalogs, all that we build so that the curator can basically build the knowledge of that artwork and defend it in front of its board. And also we, we have to build, a, uh, I don't know if we can see the PDF now, Vitaly, but, so this is two years ago, I'm saying that because uh, those pieces have lived more, but just to give you an idea of like basically each artwork that you'll see, it's in our database, and we keep track of where artworks are exhibited, and also of what is written about the artworks. Because when it comes time to defend that piece, the curator has to go back and basically situate the whole practice of the artist, and where it has resonated, and what was written about it, and validate its place in art history. And so basically, my job is not to do the sales pitch, 
my job is to give information and do a lot of research with the curator. And we work together on this and we just build that dossier. And so this would be an example and there's different pages like that of, uh, for example, this was before the power plant show, but that piece has now circulated and it keeps circulating. And at the time there was no publication, now there is. So, but each artwork you have basically a build up. And if, can we, there you go. So you travel like that. And if we uh, keep going, just to skip through, so for example, that piece on the left, it's a video installation where it was shown, what was written about it. This one was uh, shown at the Bronx Museum. So all the history of the artworks are there. Sometimes essays. Uh, we like to put the, uh, uh, the, uh, the word of the artist. So there's Leslie Maria's statement about that piece included in there. So basically that's, uh, it's not as sexy as offering champagne to a dude, but it's, it's kind of how you get artwork in a museum. <laughs> it's just that kind of, you know, you're a librarian and you, you compile information, but that's what they need, you know? Um, thank you, Vitaly. Maybe we could go back to the images. So far, did anybody have questions or like a... I uh, just keep going? Okay. So, um, so I'm going to use the examples of two artists. I don't know how I'm doing with time, but uh, if you have patience, I, I would still have things to tell you. Uh, the um, the uh, two artists that I think have, are perfect examples of artists who have agency, who can control the writing around their work, and who can also curate to a certain extent. One of them is sitting in the audience, uh, Karen Tam. Um, so Karen is a Montreal-based artist. Uh, was that the f could we go back one? I have a feeling there's a, there you go. I want you to read that beautiful statement that Karen wrote. I just think it's like so sharp. So basically that she has to write a 100, uh, it's for a, an award and she has to write a 100 uh, word text that basically wraps years of practice. And um, uh, uh, anyway, I can you read it? Can everybody read it? Or should I read it? I'll just read the beginning. Uh, Karen Tan is a Montreal artist whose research focus on the, focuses on the constructions and imaginations of cultural, culture true installations in which she recreates the spaces of Chinese uh, restaurants, karaoke lounges, sorry, I have bad sight uh, like that, opium dance, curio shops, and other sites of cultural encounters. And then it goes on about her wonderful career, a PhD at Goldsmith, and all that. The, um, but I love that statement, you know? There's this idea of, uh, that basically, sites of negotiation, sites where identity is, there's cultural encounters, and that basically, uh, the idea that, to, that fo it focus on how cultures are constructed and imagined. And right there, she puts big concepts, and when you add to that some images of her work, if we could move to the next slide. So this is one example. This was, I think, at Artskill. I think, no? Like Saint Jérôme. Saint Jérôme, OK, OK. So that's the Musée des Laurentides. And so basically, Karen recreated the curio shop. And so basically, what you have are a mix, mix of objects that are found objects, and then objects that she fabricated it around the idea of chinoiserie. So chinoiserie is not, it's basically <coughs> chinoiserie. It's the representation of China outside of China through the imagination and through the commerce. Sometimes it can be generated in China. Sometimes it can be generated in other places. Is that correct? Yeah. More or less. Yeah. Okay. And um, if we can move to the next image, the juxtaposition is super interesting to put them side by side and basically. And and what I find interesting is that Karen is, is of Chinese descent, but she was born in Montreal and basically, her access to her culture was through chinoiserie and films and popular culture also. And through also her family who had a Chinese restaurant. And uh, so the, that whole aesthetic of, uh, and catering basically, a lot of the chinoiserie aesthetic caters not to the Chinese audience, but also to the, the public here. So basically there's a mutation there. These I find so simple, but so effective. So basically these are papier mâché vases. And the, uh, <coughs> The, 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 the quote famous vases that have existed. And sometimes, this being said, sometimes they, they, there are inventions where Karen combines different things. Sometimes 
there could be, for example, a Greek iconography with a Persian iconography and a Chinese iconography and all that. But what's interesting about China is that basically through the Silk Road, other culture would arrive in China and it would be incorporated. Would it be the technique to do ceramics or some motif uh, or Persian rugs or different things? And then they would be absorbed. And then when British soldier, for example, would go to China, find, would find those objects, but they would become Chinese objects, and then it would be brought back to England as Chinese objects. And, and so what's interesting in that is, is, is that basically the culture is something built and constructed and imagined, and it, 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 it is influenced by other culture, and then it, pro it projects another image, and, but through time, history erased things, you know? And then it becomes a fiction, and it, it gets out of context, and the, the origins of that encounter, the cultural encounter, get erased, and then it, it gets more and more obscure. And those vases basically are made with uh, newspapers uh, from Chinatown, if I'm correct. And basically, they, they quote historical Chinese objects, maybe not perfectly. And what I love is that they are crooked. They, they are like, it's like history just being constructed and a bit twisted. You know? It's such a simple thing, a simple attitude, but I find it, it, it talks so much about Karen's practice and the sense of humor there also. Uh, maybe we can move to the next slide. What's interesting also is that Karen will curate space. So basically, spaces for a cultural encounter. So this is a, a thing that uh, I thought was so uh, delightful. She created. The, she was invited to create a, an recreate one of her famous installations, the Opium Den, that she had created in different exhibition. But she was invited to do it at the power plant for a fundraiser for the Powerball. And so basically, what you had is people buying tickets and some people paying a lot of money to be there earlier in the day and basically having access to that. And so basically, if you go to the next slide, you have the, the wealthy crowd uh, going through the Appian Den and through the cultural, uh, they can replay the coloni colonial history over and over, doing selfies in that space. You know? And Karen, uh, I think it's Karen laughing in the back. <laughs> anyway, but Karen was there just observing the scene and smiling. And, uh, and you can say so many things sometimes, but you don't have to name them, you know? You, you just let things unroll on their own. And I think that's something to be said about Karen and, and, and Maria, is that both artists have agents in what they say, but also in what they don't say, and how they leave those blank spaces. But to do that, it means that you have to participate in the writing around your work, and you have to participate in the curating around your work. So basically, those artists go on that territory, and that way they can achieve that level of subtlety uh, in the way their works are displayed. Maybe we could go to the next slide. That's the mysterious one. Oh, there you go. That's another project uh, that Karen uh, did. I'm, I might have mixed the two installations, but she did it twice, once in, the, in Saskatchewan. And she redid it differently and maybe uh, it was even more interesting at, at the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria in uh, British Columbia. And basically, there, w there was this uh, Chinese immigrant who um, arrived at the time of Emily Carr, and he was a traditional Chinese painter. And uh, we have nothing left, much of him, not much left of him, except an entry in Emily Carr's journal, where she explained that basically this man came to her door and knocked, and he wanted painting classes, and he unrolled his work and she realized that maybe she wanted classes with him. And basically his influence, the brushwork and the way you would dilute paint had an influence on Emily Carr. And that they basically did a workshop and they did a few drawings together. And there's one drawing that could be attributed to him that Emily Carr owned, which is chickens, hens. And um, Yunam was his name, am I correct? Linam, sorry. And so basically Karen, did a residency at the uh, Art Gallery of Greater Victoria, looking through the archives and also connecting the community, uh, the Chinese diaspora, for example, uh, in Victoria, but also the larger community, and trying to imagine what the studio of this man. So basically, you're looking at history having been erased, you know, like this man has disappeared. All you have left is Emily Carr and her voice talking about this man. And Karen's work is to go back in history and try to, you know, to give back an image of that man and what he could have been like and what. He, he could have done. So he, she recreated his studio. Maybe we could go to the next slide. Okay. So part of the museum on the right was the studio. We, we saw detail of it. <coughs> on the 
left, you had workshops. And the workshops were offered by uh, Chinese artists living in Victoria today who worked in that tradition of the ink drawing, ink paintings. And basically, for some of them, it was the first time they showed in the museum. And also, it was a way for Karen to connect with that community, include them, and uh, honor also uh, Linam. Um, so the, the public would create paintings, drawings, and, and also their collaborator, and those would be hung. And you see there was this cloud, and there was wind in it. It was really beautiful. There was just this cloud of drawings there. And on the entrance, you had the, the original drawing that we don't see. It's on the far right. And uh, so basically, it's a tr work of imagination, but it's a community working together at reimagining that moment. And that's, I think, the, the beauty and the strength of that moment. There's a lot of historical research ahead on the part of Karen, and then there's an openness to a dialogue with the community, with the curatorial community, and with the local community to kind of revisit that moment and bring them together. Also, I, I came across a, an elderly woman uh, who was coming to the museum for the very first time in her life, and she had lived there all her life. You know, so it was really beautiful that well. So, um, next slide. Okay, moving to Maria. We'll come back also, and maybe you'll have questions uh, for Karen later. Um, it's just I have a feeling we're not doing super well with time. So basically, Maria, here you have another artist run, an artist statement. So the first part is a quote from the text in Art in America, where uh, Vanessa Dian Fletcher writes quite beautifully about Maria. Uh, I've put the, I give the, that reading to Tamer. If you want to access it, you have the full text on Maria. Uh, um, but basically, we learned uh, that uh, yeah, she's at Nishnabe and also a member of the Wazak Singh First Nations, and that basically. Uh, um, like there is herself, Hubfield's work is never static. Her performances, sculptures, and installations reference different, different spans and scales of times. The, project, the projects specifically reflect her resistance to the Western tendency of to essentialize Native artists and treat them as interchangeable producers of exotic cultural experiences. Hopfield intervenes in white art institutions by incenting indigenous knowledge structures into their practices. She values extensive exchange over isolation and inclusion over hierarchy. That's a beautiful way of talking about her art, I think. And, and, and then Maria goes on to her statement. It's just I'm really bad at reading in English. Uh, I'll spare you that. But there's a mix of where she's shown, da 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 da. And then the, the together with New York based artists, uh, she explained what she's doing with that project. But um, maybe I, I'll, I'll give that material to Tamar if you want to refer to it later. But there's this idea of, the, again, that culture is something in movement, and that Maria refuses to be set in one place. You know, the, um, as we work together, we develop different things and different ways of working. I, I adapt my way of working to each artist. And with uh, Maria, we, she kind of expressed the desired ones to reaccess an artwork that she had done and s that we sold. And, uh, and that opened a, a huge reflection on the fact that, as a matter of fact, most art objects, native objects that you find in museums, were not offered to the museum. They were confiscated by the GRC. You know? Um, so what you see in museums uh, are objects that were not meant to be there, and they were not meant to be there in a plexi case. They were meant to live in a different way. And so we tell how interesting that Maria, being very much alive and, uh, and, uh, and, and doing all that art and that performative art, would have access back to her objects. And so can you hear me well, or is this? Uh, no, no, it's breaking. It's breaking, huh? How's that? That's better, huh? Okay, so, <laughs> um, so basically we start thinking that collectors or museums that acquire work should sign a paper stating that at any point she could go in the museum, access the work, and take it and perform with it and then bring it back. So basically they were holders of the work, but they were not she was keeping the ownership and the, the right to reactivate it and keep it alive the way she intended it. Um, 
Maybe we can move to sli next slide, just see what that gives us. Okay, this is uh, the first room with some of our objects. Um, that's at the power plant. And maybe we can move to the next slide. Okay, so this video, and if we go right to the next slide. Okay, so basically, and if we go back. <laughs> So they are facing each other, those video monitors, uh, projections. And the first, uh, not this one, the other one, uh, is um, her performing in the community center in Georgian Bay. And the work is a tribute to her, her mother, who's passed away. And uh, one of the dancers, her brother, uh, another is her stepsister, and her sister is playing the, the drum. And this was done in that community theater, in front of that audience. And then, basically, we'll go back to the other slide. Thank you for your patience, Vitaly. And now she performs a slightly different performance, but the same structure, at the power plant. And she asks all the staff to leave the museum while she performs, and it's filmed. And so the public has one video projection in front of an audience in Georgian Bay, and one video projection in a white cube in the power plant. Maria doesn't comment on that, she doesn't explain the purpose of that, but we can start thinking about what that could mean in terms of preferred audience and uh, having control over audience and, and making us aware of our position also and our position within, his, within how uh, First Nation art has been represented in art history and, and through uh, institutions. What's interesting that that jingle spiral, this name of that piece, the 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 cap, la cap, uh, the, the cape, uh, is there. And that piece, basically, uh, we sold to the Museum of Fine Arts way before that happened. And the Museum of Fine Arts was happy to sign that document, saying that yeah, she could access the piece and she could like borrow it and do something with it. And then, of course, there's change of staff and there's a new curator, and and comes time to where Maria's like, oh, I would really like to borrow the Jingle Spiral to do a project, you know, and so the Museum of Fine Arts, we filed the, the request, the power plant files a request, and the Museum of Fine Arts like, okay, could you specify, you know, uh, the building, the installation in the building, and da 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 da, da. And uh, they do that, but they said, but there's another component to it, you know, where she's gonna go in Georgian Bay, and they're like, oh, no, 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 <laughs> she's not going in Georgian Bay with that. No, it's an, it's an artwork, it's a sculpture. And um, and so then we went back to the contract and traced back all the emails and all the conversation and we proved that basically that was the agreement, you know. And I have to say I'm saying that, and uh, I have to say that they were extremely uh, open once they realized that that's what was happening, and it forced them to reconsider the whole structure for archiving object and the status of object and then to create a new category for that object, basically a sculpture with perf performative life, but that would be reactivated. And they went to the extent of accepting that it would be damaged, and accepting that it would not be restored if it was to be damaged, that basically it would gain a patina, and that basically that was the artwork, that basically the life and the trajectory of that artwork was the artwork, maybe more than the, 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 the static quality of the, the sculpture. And uh, where did you compromise? For example, Maria had to be driven in a museum truck to Georgian Bay, you know? <laughs> but uh, things like that that were a bit ridiculous. But we found ways to make this happen. And then the, 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 the performance happened, and they were, I think they were quite happy with how it was resolved. And, and it informed their practice as creators. Most creators are curious and they want to learn, but you have to give them an opportunity to test their knowledge and how they process things. And they go uh, forward with that. And. Um, so that has been a, an interesting case of an artist who basically decides not only here's how I do my art, not only how is it exhibited, but hey, I, I'm not letting, letting it go. You know, it's like I'm gonna keep having a control over that, and it means something that I have control over that. I'm not doing doing it just to be a prima donna. Like it, 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 it gains meaning in that relationship. So I thought that was a very interesting uh, uh, example, and the way she structured the relation to the creator, to the public. Um, I think Maria is very aware, and, and she's extremely open to dialogue. And at the same time, it's important for her to respect certain structures that are dear to her and important to her community. And uh, wait. About the reactivation, that was added to the contract, I suppose? It was in the contract to start with. 
as a note. It just did not fit the contract. So basically, I didn't know it when we did the transaction that basically when we would reactivate the piece, suddenly the whole system was like, oh, like no, that, that cannot be. So the, 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 we're very lucky that the, the museum, like the whole team has so taken the time. Now they've changed it and they create new categories. And now I guess if they acquire more work by Mario, other artists who work like that, now they'll have a way to. So basically through that, yeah. they expanded their practice. And so she's able to reactivate it. Yeah. Very interesting question. Actually, that's exactly where the museum is at. They're like, hey, could you write a protocol about that? <laughs> you know, but it goes very far. Some artists uh, will think about that and how things are to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, we'll, we'll see all this evolving. All this is basically, and that's the, the, the story of my, my relationship with my artists, is that basically I come to it with one way of thinking, but as we go forward, we keep evolving and we keep changing the way we work because they evolve as artists too, and they change, and they get a more awareness of what they are doing. So we have to adapt again and again and again. And each of them have a we have a very different way of working with each of the artists. Um, I'm just going to read in case I would have forgotten. So there's a there's a few things we could have talked about, like practical, very practical things. But I think I've touched on many of them. But just, and, and you, you're all active, like I've seen many of you around, like I know you're active, you, you know what an artist run center is, and you know what an artist statement is, and how to write one, probably you've exercised yourself a bit. But maybe if I can hammer that point that it is important to, to like really think how that artist statement will not only sell people in your practice, that's not the goal. The goal is to project a very clear idea of what you want, you know? And people will base decision on that. And you don't want to attract the wrong curator or the wrong person who's there for the wrong reason. Like it's, it's important to project that sincere image of yourself so that you attract the right people with whom you can build something more solid. Because that network that you're building is the network you'll have in 20, 30 years. But if you build it like on a tangent, like in the wrong direction, you'll just lose so much energy and so much time. You might as well just try to be honest and uh, sometimes let go of opportunities, but like project the right image and explain exactly what you want. But there's nothing wrong with that. But of course, practice your writing skills to do that. Um, <coughs> treat your artworks like they are important, and they are important. So document them well. Keep archives like where they were shown, you know, who wrote about it. If there's text about your practice, keep them all. Like all this one day might be useful you know, to defend an artwork or to go forward. Um, yeah, we could do a full workshop just on how to write emails, you know, like, and how to <laughs> get to people through emails and phone calls. But uh, maybe we won't go into that. But uh, I know I'm giving a workshop next week, so if someone wants to address those questions, we could go into it. Uh, but uh, another lesson is that there's the exhibition space. And you know, I remember being trained at uh, taking into account the exhibition space as a physical thing or as an in situ, you know, like you react to shapes around you. But try to think of it really as also like social context and how important that is, and to make it your medium, if, it, if that has to do with the art practice that you have. You know, to really not let the context drive the experience for you, but like to be participating in a dialogue with that context. Um, and the most important thing I could tell you is really to cultivate sincere friendship because basically the network you're gonna have tomorrow is probably the people sitting next to you in this room, you know? Like, so if you bond with someone, if that person you connect with, you have ideas, invite them for studio visits and cater to that friendship and cater to that relationship, you know? And go see what they do and like exchange with them, keep the contact after. Like, as I said, most of the curators I work with uh, I studied with them or I met them through projects and we kept in touch and they introduced me to other people but that is sincere and something that you, you cater to but it's so precious you know, it's the best thing you have working for you um, <laughs> well there, there, there could be the, I'll end on a quote and maybe we could move to the next uh, slides uh, next next <laughs> And then, so this is an installation, and if you go to the next one again, so this is a performance that happened in it. So this is a project done by two artists I work with, uh, Chloé Loom and Yannick Deranlo. And uh, one day, 
you know, I'm saying all this today, but like, uh, it's not as if uh, I had such a clear idea of what I, I want to do with the gallery when I opened. And so one of those early days at the gallery, I was there depressing, reading one of those texts and uh, one of those magazines stating how Jeff Koon uh, was the only thing that was going to stay from our century and blah, blah, blah. And, and how basically, you know, it's Gagosian is riding the world and it was, uh, you know, and that basically we're all going to disappear and that was it, you know. And uh, Chloe walked in and Chloe is the brightest, smartest person I know. And uh, she has a way of just slapping me in the face when I need to. And um, so I was telling her about that study and all you know, the statistics and all that. And Chloe just said, you know what, fuck them. You know, really fuck them. Because the idea is that they try to convince you that this is the art world and that basically you should have as a goal to be with Gagosian and like to be in those top collector collection and this and that. When as a matter of fact, what you realize, what you've already probably realized is that there's thousands of interesting people out there. Thousands of interesting curators, collectors, art writers, artists, and no matter which city you'll go in the world, uh, you'll find them. You'll find some interesting people. You'll find people that you, you can connect with and all that. And, and so instead of aiming for you know, being with Gagosha, maybe aiming for being in that community will provide you a, a, a nicer career, but be on a nicer career, that's what your life will be made of. You know? So you want the right stuff in your life, and that's maybe the type of relationship that you want. So on the words of wisdom of Chloe, that's basically what I had to say. <laughs> can just end with Chloe's fuck you. <laughs> 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 well, I would love to take uh, one or two questions. A couple of uh, questions? Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Any question. It could be something as practical as how you apply in a gallery or can anything. Can I give you the microphone just so we get it on the recording? Thank Hi. You. I have a bunch of questions, but I'll start with my first one. Um, so you are saying earlier um, how, uh, I mean, I've noticed so many, so many galleries closing this mm -hmm. year. It just seems like it's almost every month, mm -hmm. large gallery closing. Now, are these galleries closing permanently, or is this, are they going online? Is there an online market? Is this something new happening? Well, there's a, there's a change in what, I don't, I cannot talk for them, but I know, for example, Andrea Rosen still has a practice, but she, uh, she said in a uh, sadly famous quote that basically she would no longer deal with living clients. By that she meant living artists. So that basically there's more money doing, being done, like reselling Warhols or Jackson products, or, but that she was done dealing with artists. Um, the, so basically a lot of the economy is post-war uh, blue chip art, and contemporary art has become uh, a big part of the market also, but, and that can happen behind door, closed doors. You don't have to have a gallery to do that part, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and we could argue that what I do, the, when I deliver results, it's not when I'm sitting in my gallery, you know? It's when I'm at an opening, or when I'm in a meeting, or when I travel, or when I'm outside of my gallery. But the, we have to think of the gallery as a lab also, a place where an artist can experiment. Basically, the, the, a place where there's a space where there's nobody's going to tell them what they're going to do, and they, 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 have that, they know what that space is like, and they can work with it, and they can... I give them a few weeks to set up the show so they can goof around, try things, and all that. And, and I learn through that process also how to defend their art better. So for me, it's still an essential part of what I do. It has nothing to do with the revenues of the gallery or anything like that, but it has a lot to do with just the quality of our experience. And I have one more, if that's okay. Um, how do you meet most of your artists that you actually want to represent? Is it through art fairs? Um, aren't those people at the art fairs already represented? Uh, is it through submissions? Is it through walk-ins? Is it a mix? Yeah, I was talking about the community, so it all comes from the community. When I met Karen was I was when I was working at the art supply store here, and uh, she was a student, you no. Know? And uh, then I lost track. She went to Chicago, England, and then she came back and uh, she showed me her art, and I was blown away. Uh, most of the artists I work with 
uh, did not have a gallery before. Uh, some of them did, but for example, Maria Hopfield didn't have a gallery. Uh, Karen didn't have one. Many of them had never sold an artwork in their life. Um, but it wasn't the reason. So basically, I was not capitalizing on a market. It was more the idea that the practice was super interesting. Most of them, though, had a career in the sense that they had uh, institutional recognition and they, they were active out there. And that's somehow uh, also how I came across their work. But it, it's interesting how it, it had a lot to do with human relationships. And uh, I trust the people around me. So if one of my artists, for example, tell me, you know what, you should really check that artist, mm -hmm. I pay attention. And, uh, but I don't take fast decisions. And I've lost many artists' opportunities that way, anyway. It takes me a year or two to just like uh, chew on it and uh, I'll go see exhibitions and uh, Geneviève knows it. It's like, eh, I found a new artist and two years later, I'm like, uh, I'm still looking at it. Anyway, but uh, because I want to, I commit long term. So basically, I don't want to just come in, test it, throw out, no? Uh, to you c when you commit, you commit. I commit. Yeah. So, uh, no. And, uh, so, so that's it. So I, I take that decision very seriously. Sell the house, open the gallery. That's <laughs> <a minute. laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. It was a very quick one. Oh, and then um, You were talking about how um, the like medium-sized galleries are starting to disappear, and now we only have the giants and small galleries such as yourself. I was wondering what you, if you in that position, ever pay attention to the like very micro galleries that have kind of started up recently. Um, from my experience finishing my undergrad, we could find nowhere to show because all the mid-level artists who couldn't make it into the giant galleries were now Worth showing in small galleries and taking our spots. Yeah. And so we just started renting out storefronts and doing small one-day shows or trying to have shows yeah. in our studios. So I was wondering if that kind of thing you know, carries any weight, if it even gets noticed. For sure, or for sure. I think like, uh, first of all, like, you need to move. I mean, you need to be in movement if something is going to happen. No? You cannot sit and wait. So, so no matter what type of result they, they deliver, just the experience of, of exhibiting is gigantic, I think. And then you meet people through that experience, and it, it sets things in motion. The, in terms of results, like the results take time. No? So I find um, Often when I start working with an artist, there won't be anything really happening for two years. You know? like it, it takes a momentum. And a lot of people I work with, like our curators, will study also, just like I studied before. They will study the artist for a few years. They'll look at things. and So all that is very slow. So in a pop-up show, it, probably you do more sales to private collector, I imagine, because I don't see how that type of process. It, it, you need follow-ups. You need a lot of... So... Um, but it's the first exposure, for sure. And, um, you know, artist run centers, uh, I'm on the board of a few of them. I believe in that model hugely. But let's face it, also, there's, there's, a hu there's not enough of them. And also, they have institutionalized themselves. You know, and now they curate exhibition. They'll think of, then they won't necessarily start always from the art practice. They'll start from other agendas. And so it's more and more complicated to access them, I find. If I was a young artist, I would be frustrated with that, probably. The, uh, so the pop-up model is fantastic for that. That's how I started, by doing, I was doing envelopes, I was doing posters, but also we would uh, rent abandoned spaces and we would like just do our own things and that's how we, we just got moving, we just got to practice and to meet people. Yeah. But, but you know, there's many amazing ones in Montreal right now. Mm -hmm. we, and then like in the last five years, they boom! Oh, it's really interesting and that's a lot of what's exciting happening right now is happening there on that scene, definitely. Thank you. Welcome. It was just um, to find out about this. You mentioned the workshop that you'd be giving uh, next uh, week. Tamarick and uh, Simon. Yeah. At, uh, next, the November 30th? I feel like this is the beginning of a much longer mm -hmm. conversation. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there will be a seminar Yeah, next next week. At, you just confirmed the time, right? Four to six, I think. Four to six on Thursday? Yeah. On Thursday. So. Uh, Here? Yeah, we. Uh, it's for students. It's for students oh, only. But okay. maybe give me your email addresses, and we can we can pack. Okay. We can pack the bodies into the room. <laughs> maybe up to twenty five. It'll be a crowded mm -hmm. seminar space. But I think we have a lot of wisdom to share, and uh, there's a lot of curiosity about it here. So yeah, because we haven't talked about practical stuff, but there's so many just practical things that can help that we could just uh, address. The right environment for yeah.
Is there a last question or? Yeah, maybe another oh, question. Yeah. Thanks, Brad. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ug, thank you very much for uh, a great talk and uh, for kind of lifting the veil off some of the, uh, the mysteriousness that happens on the, on the art commercial level. I do have one question though. You're, you're making a comparison in, in terms of you know, the, the mega galleries like Gagosian and then the mid-level galleries that are disappearing. Um, and you're talking about your space as um, a space of experimentation mm -hmm. um, and of making connections to uh, major collections. My question for you is what is your stance on the rise of the university or the institutional gallery as a space where works are now, um, th they've taken on a lot more of a larger role than strictly a pedagogical role or one that strictly serves the, uh, um, uh, the research interests of the institute mm -hmm. itself. They actually almost operate somewhere between an artist-run center and um, uh, like a, a regular gallery. Well, they, they, they've been around. Uh, they, they were important certainly already uh, when I was a student. Um, I think the, if the context has changed, we could say that uh, um, there's less funding for museum and, and uh, exhibition spaces and uh, Sometimes it can have an effect on uh, critical practices in any case. And uh, the university galleries, have, uh, I find, uh, are in a position to do a lot of research and to take their time and uh, often produce absolutely wonderful exhibitions because of that. And uh, they're a bit less cut up with fundraising or their activities. It doesn't interfere like in the same way. Uh, and I think if I was to think of the... Canadian art scene, uh, and specifically the Montreal art scene. I remember when I was starting the dialogue about Montreal, Brooklyn, uh, the Brooklyn galleries were amazed you know, the, by the quality of research here, the quality of writing around art, and that for them was something specific to our art scene that they did not have in the fast pace of New York or Brooklyn. And uh, those universities are definitely contribute to that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome. Let's uh, let's thank Ug, the the personnel. Have to, uh, <laughs>